Well, it is 201, so why don't we go ahead and start. I see we've got several eyeliner players in here. Welcome, guys. Hi. Hello, hello. Howdy, howdy. Yeah, I hear Atani and A Santa. Do you guys want to uh, do introductions, or you want to go straight to Ashwin? You guys want to say hey in your eyeliner names, maybe? Sure. <laughs> Why don't we start with Ariel? <laughs> <you're> Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ariel, aka AE Santa One. Been a part of iWire since like two months after its inception, so it's a cool community to be a part of. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Okay, I guess I'll go next. Um, I'm Melissa, aka Atani. Um, I've been playing iWire since about a year after it started um, and just really have fun with it. Kevin? Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay, it works. Yeah. What's your, uh, your, if you want to share your iWire username, you're welcome to, but if you're, if oh, you don't uh, Dragon Turtle. Okay, cool. Nice to see you. Cool. In the voice. <laughs> nice to put a voice with the name. Yeah. And we've got Lynn as well. Lynn C, probably. And Manfred, if you want, do you want to say hey or anything? It looks like he's muted. Yeah, he's muted. Well, anyway, thank you for being here, Manfred. And I, I hear there's a, there's a, a piece of weather here. A twister, perhaps. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Welcome, Twister. And uh, I, and then I'm Amy Sterling, so I, I run iWire and trying to figure out how we're gonna do Neo. Um, and then really the most important VIP on this call is Ashwin, who is an awesome postdoc at Sun Lab. And I'll just, I'll just pass it off to you now, Ashwin. <laughs> oh, hey, I'm Ashwin. I've been in the Sun Lab way before I was started. <laughs> so I've been, I've been here for a long time. Um, all right, so I, I, um, Wait, I when did you join the lab? Uh, maybe I shouldn't talk about it. It just ages me. <laughs> <laughs> no. I've, I've, been, I've been here a long time. I think I've been in the lab since 2011. Cool. Cool. Yeah. We were together in the MIT days. That's right. Um, yeah, so I'm, I just, uh, you know, we, Amy figured we should put uh, a few slides together to talk about some of the science for the Zebrafish project. Um, and uh, let's, so, so I'm going to try to introduce some of the signs and please feel free to stop and ask questions. I've, I've, it's fairly informal, so. All right. Cool. Um, all right, so I've titled it How to Z-Fish. I'm calling it Z-Fish because uh, the data set that we are reconstructing is from a larval zebra fish. So, you know, let me let me first begin with uh, some of the basic things that we're trying to study. Let's put it out of the way. So, what are we trying to study over here? We're trying to study how the brain controls the eyes. Uh, so I have a small, I have a, I have a, I have a picture over here of a of an eye, uh, and so that's a round circle, spherical circle, uh, and all the pink things on the sides are muscles that control the eye. So each eye has six muscles that control it, two on the left and right. So that controls horizontal motion, two on top, so that's the rectus muscle, they control vertical motion. And there are two oblique muscles that control kind of uh, torsion, so that's when the eye twists essentially. So these are the, these are the six muscles that each eye has all, uh, a, a pair of these. And uh, together they kind of coordinate to move your eye to wherever it needs to move to, to view something essentially. 
So why is it important to study eye movement? Uh, you know, the whole the whole goal of moving your eye is so that you can focus your vision on something of interest. So if you were to lose the ability to move your eye precisely, it would kind of impair the whole purpose of vision. Um, and 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 from a more kind of a clinical standpoint, uh, a lot of people suffer from uh, disorders that relate to eye or eye movement. Uh, and I have one such example here, it's called nystagmus. Uh, this is basically when uh, the two eyes aren't coordinated and one eye may, you know, kind of uh, misbehaves essentially. So, so it, although you intend to move your eye to a certain location, uh, maybe one eye follows the intention, whereas the other eye does not follow the intention as well. Yeah. So that's the that's the picture over there of of uh, this is just an example of a person making eye movements. So you can see the two eyes aren't synced. Whereas in the in the frame in between, when the person's looking straight ahead, both the eyes are synced. But when the person's looking either to the left or to the right, you said that the eyes aren't are aren't synced together essentially. <clears throat> so this is why it's important to study eye movement. Um, and then so where in the brain. Um, are the centers that kind of coordinate and are responsible for eye movement. Uh, and, and the answer to that is basically the, the brain stems. Everything that sits below your cerebellum uh, is largely responsible for coordination and movement of eyes. Uh, so again, in that schematic that you have down there, we have the small circular globe, that's the eye. Uh, and to each one of these muscles that sit on the side of the eye, there are these red kind of wires that are that's showing you which nerve is projecting to this particular eye muscle. And all these nerves have their origin in the brainstem. So these make up part of your cranial nerves um, uh, that innervate your eye. Okay, any questions so far? No, nope, all good. All right. Um, so, so let's expand on that small schematic that we saw over there. So to the left is again the, the, the kind of the gross picture of where the nerves that project to the eye muscles are. And then I'm expanding that small black box to see down there, which is in the brainstem essentially. Uh, and we put, we put a name to some of those centers. So you can see uh, in, in the middle panel, panel A, there's the cerebellum. Uh, the part labeled SC is the superior colliculus. There's the thalamus. Um, and all those abbreviations down there are different kind of nuclei. They're called nuclei. That a nuclei basically is just a, an amalgam of many cells put together that are kind of distinct from their neighboring cells. So each one of these nuclei are in some form or shape responsible or are involved in the eye movement pathway. Um, and the Roman numerals that you see down there, I think there's a Roman numeral four and six. Those are, those are, um, those are basically um, the abducens and the oculomotor nuclei that are eventually send the nerves out that then project to the eye muscles. And then in panel B, I'm, I'm showing uh, I'm, I'm breaking up those nuclei into a more kind of a generalized figure where uh, it's, it's, it's showing what kind of neurons reside in each one of these nuclei. Um, so if you were to stick an electrode in each one of these nuclei, what would the firing of one of these neurons look like essentially is, is the summary. So for example, if you were to stick an electrode in the orange circle, which is supposed to show the superior colliculus, you would see a neuron that basically initially has a very low firing rate and then it has a very high firing rate. So that's the, that's the brown histogram that's right beside the, the orange sphere. Are you guys following me so far? Ah, uh, so those, um, those brown things are basically the unique firing patterns of each? Of Correct. Each Correct. It's, a, it's a unique firing pattern of an example neuron from one of those brain areas. Ah, so, okay. So yeah, so the firing pattern of a neuron in the superior colliculus would kind of look like 
like that brown pattern. So it would have a very low firing rate initially. And then when the eye moves, it has a very high firing rate. So essentially it is sending what is called a command signal to move the eye to a certain location in space. So when the firing rate increases, boom, your eye moves essentially. Hmm, and, so, and so downstream of the superior colliculus are these other New, uh, the, uh, these other neurons that sit in different nuclei uh, and, and these abbreviations basically stand for burst neurons or excitatory burst neurons, inhibitory burst neurons, omnipause neurons. And each one basically has a different characteristic of firing. So uh, for example, the EBN that you see over there is called an excitatory burst neuron. Its property is basically to turn on and turn off. So it, it has a kind of a very bursty pattern and then it stops and then it starts again and then it stops It starts again and it stops. So, and every, every time it fires, it commands the eye to move to a certain location in space. And then if you look at uh, the Roman numeral six, which is the abducens motor neuron, uh, those neurons over there have, you know, when they receive an input, essentially what they do is first they have a very high firing rate and then it, kind of scales down to a very low firing rate, essentially. So what that shows you is initially, the, the initial firing rate is responsible for moving the eye to a certain point in space, which is a high firing rate. That's the, that's the command signal that's traversing down the pathway. And then for the eye to remain in that particular point in space, the muscle needs to receive some activity. So, only the, so muscles basically, when they receive some activity from a nerve, they contract. And that contraction is what makes a muscle move whatever targeted organ it's moving. So for the muscle to remain in that particular point in space, it's constantly being contracted. So it needs to constantly receive some input. So that's the low firing rate that you see immediately post movement of the eye. <clears throat> and then I have a small arrow uh, to this blue color sphere down there, which is the NPH, which is a kind of a Latin abbreviation for the integrator neurons. So that's the neurons that we're studying in our particular system. Um, and they have a very kind of a unique property, which I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Do you guys have any questions so far? Uh, everything okay here. Thank sure. you. I think someone's eyewire music is playing. <laughs> Oh, is that eyewire music? Yeah, that's the soundtrack. Man, it's pretty uh, calming. I think it's from either Lynn or George. Uh, I am George, hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, I am a biology, a biology teacher here in Greece in high school. Oh, nice to meet you. Yeah, sure. And uh, we're working on uh, eyewire with some uh, students. Uh, and uh, we're having a lot of fun and interest uh, here at our school. Oh, that's so awesome to hear. Yeah, that's yeah, really sure. cool. Thank you, thank you. And uh, the, the kids are very excited and we're going to present our work uh, in, um, in the Brain Awareness Week um, event here in Patras, uh, if you know this city of uh, Greece. Oh. So uh, it was very interesting to get here and uh, get to know some people and go on. <laughs> <laughs> all right all right so um so yeah let's let's continue with the science of uh, of the yeah, zebrafish sure. project um so yes yeah, so in the previous slide um you know i just mentioned that there are different neurons and different nuclei in the brainstem that have different firing properties uh, and so we are interested in this one type of neuron that's called the integrator neuron. And then let me talk about why we call it the integrator neuron. So essentially what, um, what integrator neurons do is um, they receive an input. Uh, and let's say in, the, in this particular example over here, you'll, if you see the cell that is encoding for the velocity, which is the burst cell essentially. So the way it responds is initially it's quiet and then it has a, a very quick burst of activity and then it stops essentially. So that's the burst cell, that's the input. 
And if you were to stick an electrode into an integrator neuron, what you would see is um, this integration property, which is initially, it has a very kind of a low firing rate. And then it takes the input that comes from the burst cell. It adds that onto its baseline. And then it then, then some, somehow it can remember where it ended up and it fires at a constant rate. Uh, are you guys following this so far? Yep. Right, so it starts off at a baseline firing rate. It integrates the signal that's coming from upstream from a neuron that it's, it's listening from. And then it, it ends up at a particular firing rate and then it sticks to that particular firing rate. So in, the, in a sense, it's integrating the signal over a period of time and it can remember that signal and then it passes it on to the next neuron downstream. Right? So it's basically um, summing up whatever activity it has over a period of time, which is why we call it an integrator neuron. And there's, there's another sense in which it's also called an integrator neuron because what it ends up doing is the input neurons are basically encoding for velocity commands and the output that it ends up sending is a position signal. So in, in the mathematical sense also, it's, it's basically it's integrating velocity to provide position. Right? So in, two, in those two senses is, is, is why it's called an integrator neuron essentially. So, so, so what does this action result in essentially? So, so when, when the superior colliculus uh, sends a command for the eye to go to a unique location. So let's say um, the superior colliculus sends a command saying, move the eye 10 degrees to the left. So the eye immediately, the burst neuron fires at a particular firing rate. It moves the eye, let's say 10 degrees left. Now in, if there were no other signal coming into this system, then the eye would automatically droop back and come to its resting position. So there is nothing to tell the eye to stay at that particular point in space. So now, now, if, now with the integrator neurons in the, in the pathway, what happens is first the superior colliculus say, provides a command to say, I move the eye 10 degrees to the left. The eye gets to 10 degrees in the left. And now since there's the integrator in there, it also receives the signal, but then it integrates that signal and it produces a firing rate, which is this constant firing rate at the end of the integrator, which keeps the eye 10 degrees to the left. So it, it, it prevents the eye from drooping back to a normal position. So, so it does, two, it does, it does two, two things. So basically it gets the eye to a particular point in space and it keeps the eye at that particular point in space, right? So, um, I'm not, yeah, I have a question. so if it stops firing, then the eye goes back to its original position. Correct. So the, so the, the eyes are sitting in our socket, which basically is surrounded by this viscous fluid. So anytime the muscle is not pulling or pushing, the eye will come back to its restive state, which is, which is the central position. Hmm. So, so every time the muscle fires, you're actually, it's actually pushing and pulling this eye in the socket against the viscous forces inside the socket. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool. So, yeah, so this, this is the central concept that, that we need to understand about the integrator neuron, which is, uh, its input is just a very short burst, but its output is a kind of a prolonged firing. So it's able to take this short input and it's able to integrate that signal and keep, keep that signal propagated within itself. Right? So that's the central crux. Um, and although, although in this particular schematic, you just see one circle, in, within each circle, within each nuclei, there are hundreds of neurons that are doing this particular property. Right. So, so how do it, these integrator neurons receive only a very small input, but make it into a very long kind of a thing prolonged over time? So that's the fundamental question that we're trying to answer. Um, given a small, a short, an, a, a, a short input over a small period of time, how does this become a prolonged output over a long period of time? So that's, that's, a, so that's the fundamental question that we are trying to answer. And, and we think uh, the neurons 
in this area can do that uh, by having some a very kind of a stereotypic connectivity pattern. So one way to think of this is think of it like a kind of like dominoes essentially. So within this integrator network, if there were one neuron that gets started up, it then talks to the second neuron, which then talks to the third neuron, which then talks to the fourth neuron, which then talks back to the first neuron again. So it's kind of a, like a loop essentially. And you could keep the signal propagated within this loop for a long period of time. So, so this, is, this is a theory. We, we don't know if it's true. So now we want to test this theory. So to test this theory, ideally, we would like to see if the, the neurons within the integrator are also connected to each other in this kind of a loop-like pattern, essentially. So it, it, more formally, it's called a recurrent network. So are, are the neurons inside the integrator forming a recurrent network? Is the, is the primary question that we're trying to answer. Are you guys on board? Yep. All right. So, so yeah, so, so to understand how the integrator can do this, we chose to map the connectivity between all neurons within this integrator circuit and the larger circuit that's involved in eye movement coordination. And so for us to be able to do this, uh, we have a few, few prerequisites. So what are these prerequisites that we need in order to study the eye movement system? So first is we need to be able to move the eyes or whatever organism that we are studying needs to, be, have, needs to have the ability to move its eyes. Uh, we need to be able to record from the brainstem so that we can actually read out what these neurons are doing. Uh, and then if you have theories and hypotheses that you want to test, you want to be able to manipulate this particular system. And we want to do all of these above in, a, in, a, in the lifetime of maybe a graduate student, which is about four or five years, <laughs> right? We, wow. we, don't want to, we don't want to take on a challenge that you just can't answer within your lifetime. Right. I mean, it, it, <laughs> people eventually lose motivation. So, so, so these are all our prerequisites. So given these prerequisites, we said, okay, what's the best model organism that will satisfy all these conditions? And the answer that we came up with is the larval zebrafish. So a larval zebrafish can move its eyes. It also makes eye movements much like a, a human. So, so that satisfies the first prerequisite. Uh, we can record from its brainstem. Uh, the reason we can do that is at the larval stage, this fish is transparent. So you can actually see the neurons while they're firing. Um, and to be able to test some of these theories, uh, what you can do is you can control the firing rate of these neurons using transgenic properties. So you can shine light, you can turn them on, you can turn them off, you can do, you can do a bunch of things. So you can start testing your theories. So, so yeah, so then let's talk about the larval zebrafish. So, I mean, a, a typical larval zebrafish, I think, has a lifespan of about two years. Um, and from, from its embryonic stage, it becomes an adult in about 120 days. Right? So, so within three months, it's an adult. When we work with the animal in this larval stage, so the larval stage essentially is anything between three days to 24 days. So at this larval stage, it looks much like a tadpole. Uh, and then it eventually gets pigmented and then it becomes an adult where it has these striations. And the striations are what make it look like a zebra. So it's called a larval zebra fish, essentially. It's, it's called a zebra fish and we're working at the larval stage. Right. So like I mentioned, at, at a very young age, it's transparent. So the panel to the left you can see is, uh, if you're just looking through and through the actual organism, uh, the two large discs on either side are the eyes. So you can see, you can actually see the eyes when they're moving. Uh, you can actually see the blood flowing through the, the, the vasculature while the animal is at this particular stage. You can see its fins, you can see its tail. The larval zebrafish has a very kind of a rich behavioral repertoire. 
So you can quantify how it's swimming, whether it's swimming forward, if it can swim to one side, if it's turning, things like that. So you have a lot of these um, behaviors that are also interested. So you can look at the brain and you can look at some of the behavior and then you can also then ask the question, is brain area A involved in behavior A, et cetera. Um, there are lots of transgenic fish available. By that I mean uh, there are lots of mutants with different things either knocked in or knocked out, uh, fluorophores put in, et cetera, that you can, so there's a library of all these mutants so given the question that you're asking, you can then go back and you can say, well, in, you know, in the library, there is this one particular mutant that has a deficit of this particular behavior. Let me study this particular mutant, et cetera. So, so the fluorescent image that you see over here is essentially uh, the, the larvae overlaid, the brain overlaid onto the larvae. So only the neurons in the brain are expressing the fluorophore. So you can roughly see where the brain sits in right behind the eyes. So, so that's the transgenic fish. Uh, and, and then the library that you see on either side is, is just kind of all the available kind of transgenics uh, for this particular animal's model. So there are tens of thousands of transgenics that are available that you can go back and you, know, you, can, you can study each one of these. You guys have questions so far? Hello? I guess that means no questions. Okay, all right. Yeah, as long we're as... good so far. All right. So, 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 so I guess the, the, our, our choice, the, the way we study some of these circuits is uh, by, by, um, by using the electron microscopy to, to look at the circuit diagram in, in, the, in the brain. So the technique that we use over here is different from the technique that was used for E2198. That's a retina data set that's available on um, iWire. So the technique that we're using over here is called, um, uh, it's uh, an, an automated lit, uh, ultra, ultra microtome essentially. So essentially what it is, is a, it's a long conveyor belt which collects sections as they're being cut. Uh, and each one of these sections is then imaged on a electron microscope. So think of it like a deli slicer. Um, so if you look at it in panel F, the orange amber colored part is where the actual sample is. So if you remember uh, Jurassic Park and you remember the mosquito inside the amber, it's something like that. So we take our fish and we put it inside amber and then we chop it up really, really thin. And when it's, when it's being sliced, this conveyor belt is basically picking up each one of these sections as it's coming off the knife. And so then we end up with a, with a cassette of many such sections. Uh, so that's the cassette and you can see each one of the small black dots over there is, is one sliver of the fish coming out. Uh, and you can have, and you have many such slivers that you can put together and you can image it on the electron microscope. So what I'm showing you here is to the left is kind of a gross image of the entire uh, it's one silicon wafer that has many small sections. So one small red box over there, if you blow it up, is one section of the fish. Uh, and the, the so, so you can, I've removed the particular, the eyes for this particular fish. So you, I'm, you're just seeing the brain and the tail. Uh, and, the, and the small red box over there is blown up uh, to show you where the high resolution images were acquired for this particular data set. And then you can image this over a few months and then you end up with a small volume. Uh, you, you do a lot of computational stitching and alignment to end up with a kind of a seamless looking volume of EM data. Good so far? Yeah, I believe so. Okay, All right. So, so just to give you a, a schematic, so this is just a kind of a cartoon of, of the fish. Uh, and that's where our data set is. So essentially we remove the eyes and, uh, and the mouth and things like that. And then we chop the fish up really thin. So the, 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 the things that you can see are what, so I've labeled some of the parts. So you can see what's called the optic tectum that sits right behind the eye. 
So cells in the retina project immediately to the optic tectum. Then there's the midbrain, and then there's the hindbrain. So all the cells that are, or the neurons that are involved in controlling eye movement sit in the hindbrain. So that's, that's where our high resolution data set is. Oh, and hey, can I ask you one question? Uh, sure. Yeah, Atani. So the question is, uh, is it typical that the entire fish is put in the resin and sliced, or do you just take the sections from the brain? Um, I, I choose to put the whole thing in, but different people have different strategies. Uh, yeah, there is, there is no, there's no hard and fast rule for either, either strategy, yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so so then we we go ahead and we image we image the whole thing, um, and then okay, so then you know what's what, uh, so like I mentioned previously, the the resolution of this particular data set is um, each pixel is five nanometers in lateral resolution, so that's um, five by five nanometers, and then in the in the, uh, in the third dimension, it's forty five nanometers. And so what's visible at five nanometers? So the, uh, the, I, so if I remember correctly, the E2198 data set is 17.5 nanometers by 17.5 nanometers. So this is, this is almost three times higher resolution uh, in, in, each, in each dimension than E2198. So, so why do we want E2198 this? is iWire. I'm sure you guys know that, but. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so, so the question is why, why, why is it important to image at this particular resolution? Uh, and, and the answer is we, we want to be able to see um, a lot of features like synaptic vesicles. Uh, so I have a small kind of a schematic over here as to what's visible in this data set. So I've highlighted a few parts. Uh, so in red is, uh, is what I'm calling a dendrite. Uh, in A is an axon that's opposing that particular dendrite, uh, and uh, M is just is for mitochondria, which is in blue essentially. So you, if you look at them, you see each one has kind of a different shape, orientation. The mitochondria looks very different from everything else. It's much darker, uh, and then we also see things like synaptic vesicles and things like that. So I'll get to that in the next slide, actually. Uh, I actually have Sorry. a question. Yep. Um, because the mitochondria looks pretty similar to um, a nucleus, at least from like what I could tell from Mystic. How can you tell the difference between the two? Um, so the nucleus of the cell, well, actually, so the mitochondria is much, much smaller than the nucleus, right? So the, by, by nucleus, do you mean the cell body? Ah, uh, never mind. That was my mistake. Because the, the nucleus would obviously be in the cell body. Never mind. I think I got confused with like. Right. So the nucleus would be inside the cell body, and it would be gigantic as compared to the mitochondria. Okay. Right. So the mitochondria. So for example, in this particular figure that you see over here, that the the blue part spans probably three hundred micro nanometers across. Right. But as the cell body is ten microns, so that's. 5,000 or 3,000 times bigger. Okay, it'll, yeah. It'll, 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 it will be much, part, much right? larger, yes. <laughs> so, so I know a lot of people have, um, you know, this data looks very different from IY, the IY data set because in the IY data set, um, everything that's inside the cell was on, you know, purposely it was kind of, um, stained in a, in a manner that it doesn't stain anything inside the cell. So you can only see the boundaries on the outside. So you can't see synapses and mitochondria and other such detail. Right? So a lot of people have expressed that um, this particular data set takes, takes a while getting used to essentially. So, so let's go, so go over some fundamentals of synapses. What, what is a synapse? So a, a synapse basically is a junction where one cell is talking to another cell. Uh, so they, so cell, so by, well, when I say cell, I'm, I'm, I mean neuron. So uh, a particular neuron has 
thousands of such synapses and at each one of these synapses, it's talking to another partner neuron essentially. So to the left are a couple of panels uh, that's showing you know, different types of synapses. So for example, in, in panel A, you can see a synapse. Um, can you guys see the cursor when it's moving? Yes. Yes, okay, perfect. So, um, so these small, small uh, globules that you see over here are called vesicles. Uh, and these vesicles are sitting opposed to, um, to, a, to a dendrite that's as the recipient. So, uh, so the axon is where the vesicles are and the dendrites are basically receiving whatever is inside each one of these small globules. So typically what happens is inside each one of these vesicles, there sits a particular chemical called a neurotransmitter that, um, that then, you know, when, a, when, a, when, a, when cell A wants to communicate with cell B, um, a particular ve vesicles will basically dock against this membrane over here and they will release what's called a payload. So they release the payload, which is then picked up on the other side. And this is how communication happens between A and B. Uh, and so over here, you see there is a kind of a darkening just sitting right below where the vesicles are. So this darkening is basically called a density. And this density is dark because it's filled with proteins that are basically sitting over there waiting for something to come from the opposite side. They're, they're filled with what are called receptors. So the receptors are just waiting to listen in on is another neuron sending a signal, yes or no, essentially. So in panel B, you can see over here that this particular dendrite has two such densities. Uh, so there, there are actually two synapses over here, right? So you see one large uh, black density over here and there's another black density over there. And so I've also shown a small schematic, a cartoon on the side. So in green is, um, is the vesicles that are sitting part of the axon. So, um, I, so while, when I made this figure, it's, I realized it's a bit confusing because each, each small circle over here, the large green circle is one vesicle in the EM. And the small orange circles inside are supposed to be what's inside the vesicle. So that's the neurotransmitter. Right? So when, when the axon which has the vesicle is communicating with the dendrite, one of these vesicles will merge against the membrane and then it'll dump all this neurotransmitter out. So in this schematic over here, you can see it's dumping a particular chemical called glutamate, which is then picked up by a receptor that sits on the density and then it communicates some particular signal to the opposite side. Um, and then the lower panel over here is, I, I just have a few example synapses from the zebrafish data set. In each case, I have um, I've colored either the axon or the dendrite. So for example, this purple part over here is a dendrite because on the opposite side are vesicles and there's a very thin density over there. Uh, in, the second, in the second panel, the axon in blue is colored and you can see the vesicles are sitting right on the membrane, which is kind of darkish as compared to the other membrane. So that's the, the opposite side is the dendrite and the blue part is the axon. Similarly, the orange part is the axon because it has vesicles and the opposite side is a dendrite and it has a mitochondria inside over there. Um, again, the axon uh, is, is engulfing the dendrite in this case. In the last case in yellow, the axon is almost kind of uh, all around the dendrite and the dendrite is sitting in the center uh, receiving in information essentially. Okay, do you guys have questions? So, uh, synapse uh, is always between the axon and the dendrite. In 99.99%, yes, that is true. There are some very few exotic cases where there are synapses between either axons. So, they're called axo axonal synapses, or you have dendrodendritic synapses. But they're very, very um, uncommon and I think they're found only in a few areas in the brain. For example, in the olfactory circuit, you see uh, dendrodendritic synapses. And another difference, uh, if you look at this particular panel is, um, the panel on top, the EM looks much more crisp and cleaner than the panel below. Uh, so the panel on top is um, synapses that were imaged on a transmission electron microscope, so it's called a TEM. 
whereas the panel below, which where our zebrafish data set was, um, is from is imaged on a scanning electron microscope, an SEM. So it has lower resolution than the TEM, so which is why the TEM has better images than the SEM. All right. I think this is the toughest slide. Any other questions? Oh, okay, I'll move on. Oh, and there were there were some um, there were also some questions about um, cytoskeleton. So, so what is the cytoskeleton? So you can think of the cytoskeleton as uh, as basically bones in your body, essentially. So it's whatever keeps the flesh on top from collapsing onto itself. So it's the scaffolding that's inside every cell, every organelle, every dendrite, and every axon that partic that helps maintain the shape of the axon or the shape of the dendrite. So in this particular data set, the cytoskeleton is visible in, 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 in the form of these long lines that you see inside. So these thin lines that you see are all kind of part of this network of cytoskeleton that's keeping an axon or a dendrite from collapsing onto itself. It's the scaffolding that's on the inside. Now I've shown, I've purposely shown two images over here, which is basically cytoskeleton in two orientations. So on the left, if you see, you see these long thin lines, but on the right, if you look, they're, they're, they show up as these small dots. Uh, and the reason this happens is just because of the orientation. So in this cartoon that I have up here, imagine if the cytoskeleton was like a bunch of spaghetti. And if you were to cut this in half where that red line is, and if you were to look from top, so rather than seeing lines, you would end up seeing small circles. Right? So that's exactly what you're seeing in these two images. So in one particular view, you're looking at the cytoskeleton from the side, so you see the actual long kind of spaghetti-like structure. But in the other view, you're looking at it where it's kind of perpendicular, so you see just these small dots. And in the lower panel here, again, is just another example of the cytoskeleton much more clearly visible over here. <clears throat> So I, I think this basically covers pretty much all the major things that you will see inside a particular cell and inside a dendrite and an axon. So you will see mitochondria, you will see cytoskeleton, you will see synapses, and you will see vesicles. So those, those I, I think those will be the main things that you encounter. And okay, so I think this video plays. So this is just a cool video. I thought I should walk you through this video. So everything I've mentioned so far is summarized in this video that's quite beautiful, which is, it's basically how vesicles end up um, at a synapse. So each one of these small globes is a vesicle. Mm. So let me just stop it there and I'll, let me just talk you through what this is. So each- Oh, is the, that the uh, protein kinesin that actually transports- Perfect, perfect, yes, perfect, perfect. Kinesin is a motor protein, this is exactly what it does. Um, so the green globes that you see over there is the vesicles and there are some proteins shown in these kind of purple, small green looking things. Um, and, and these long chains are the cytoskeleton, right? And this, this small, a purple protein down here, the light purple protein is a kinesin, which is called a motor protein, which binds a vesicle and pulls it along the cytoskeleton. So vesicles are actually made in the cell body, but they're transported to the end of an axon or a dendrite using motor proteins. So there you see it's getting transported. Cool. So that's the neurotransmitter getting inside the vesicle over there. Whoa, that's really cool. So 
so yeah so that that's that's essentially what happens so that, that so that schematic showed one particular vesicle it merging to the membrane and then it's opening it up it's con it's opening its contents and dumping all the neurotransmitters so this happens a gazillion times a minute <laughs> right that's kind of so, mind boggling so yeah so that's that's the process Okay, so that was the basics of the science. Uh, have you, do you guys have any questions so far? Uh, it's okay. <laughs> All right, so now, um, so, so, so this, the, the entire data set was segmented and uh, put online. Um, and I think right now, um, uh, it's being promoted through a particular class called Mystics. So Mystics can play this particular data set. But I think Amy is going to mention something about how more people can play this, I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think there are, Celia, maybe you know this number, what, there's 28 or 30 mystics so far? Uh, and you guys have been cranking through the cells at a very impressive rate. Uh, and we just wanted to encourage you guys, so if this sounds interesting, you know, understanding the integrator circuits and interacting in a, a different data set with different images and even different UI where you can kind of adjust the threshold of the segmentation. Um, do reach out to HQ if you're interested in becoming a mystic. Uh, I think, I don't know, I don't remember whether we have uh, player sponsored promotions to mystic at this time. We can set that up. Um, I know Ashwin told me, and I hope it's okay to relay it here, but um, he was really impressed with the work that you guys have done so far and your skill and accuracy in constructing these cells. I know in the beginning it was not certain whether these, these very difficult cells would be able to be done in iWire, um, but you guys have proven that you're very capable uh, and, ex and excelling at this task. Um, so. Thanks, Atani. Maybe we'll we'll discuss at HQ whether we can uh, and, and touch base with you, Ashwin, as well. Whether we can do player sponsored promotions to Mystic, I don't see why not. Um, but that would allow more players from the IWR community to be working on zebrafish cells and and access these kind of new tools and larger cubes. Yep. We're yeah, impressed, so. and we want uh, more of you, more Mystics. Absolutely. Yeah, so, so the, way, the way they've been playing so far is a bit different from how I think it's in iWire. Um, typically, uh, a player plays an entire cell at, in one sitting, or, or in, in one session, rather. Um, so essentially, we, we feed the cell, which is then played by uh, one player. Uh, I'm going to call that player, player A. Uh, and that player can play the particular cell with or without the assist of an AI. So um, the AI basically is, um, is um, will, will, will fill the cell up ahead of time. Uh, so if you turn it on, the AI will basically start populating the cell with what it thinks is correct. Um, and occasionally it makes mistakes. We have some, hold on, we have some, there's some background noise for like, sounds like paper or something. If you're, maybe if you're not talking, if you could just mute your mic. It's kind of hard to hear Ashwin with that. Okay, that's that. That <laughs> that's makes sense. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so, so once the AI fills in, uh, it, 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 it tends to do a couple of things, the AI. So the AI ha it suffers from a lot of kind of um, false terminations. So it'll stop prematurely. So it thinks that the cell has ended over there. In reality, it may not have ended. Uh, the AI also merges two thing, two objects when it should not have merged two objects, essentially. So at these junctures, we, we, we expect um, uh, uh, humans to intervene and correct the AI, essentially. So that's, that's kind of the gameplay. Um, so, so once a person plays the cell as player A, that person then passes it on to another player, which I'm going to call player B over here, who can also either uh, make corrections to player A's cell um, or add, uh, you know, or just agree or disagree with whatever they think is appropriate. 
uh, and then they it gets passed on and said and um, and it checked by experts and and finally all the kind of accuracy in the system is um, uh, essentially comparing what player a did with respect to the final expert trace or what player day b did with 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 with, uh, with the final expert so every individual or every player has two scores uh, the score as player a and the score as player b uh, and and and, and it, it should not be surprising that typically as player a your scores will be slightly lesser than as player b because you're playing it there are more changes to make while you when you're playing it for the first time essentially uh, and this graph over here basically is just showing you um, for a particular cell, how much of that cell is typically played by the AI, how much of that cell is played by a trace, the, first, the first player, and how much of the cell is played by the second player. Um, so the AI is in, is in teal, tracer A is in orange, tracer B is in, I think, brown. So, I mean, so on average, if you, if you look, it, it seems that the AI can get about 70% of the cell correct. Uh, and then the, the, the next, you know, the, the 25 to 30% is contributed by the person who plays it first. And, and a small fraction is then contributed by whoever plays it next, essentially. So that, that, that seems to be kind of the trend so far. Uh, and so here are some cells that were reconstructed uh, both in-house and by some of our players online. Uh, and I'm showing you these cells just because they're, they're some of the kind of the stereotypic cells that are found. So any larval zebrafish, or for that matter, any fish has, uh, has these neurons at the same location at the same age, essentially. So to, to the right, essentially, is a, is a very old image of these cells as they occur in some of the fishes. So this was before the days of when people were doing CD electron microscopy. So these were just kind of dye fills. But you can see that uh, we are able to kind of reconstruct the same cells that people saw in like the 70s, essentially. So this figure is from the 70s. And we were able to also reconstruct the same thing. And then we, you also see that these cells occur kind of in the same stereotypical, stereotypical positions. Although we have it, it, the, 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 the data set that we have is much richer. Uh, we can see the synapses on each one of these cells, all the locations, et cetera. Um, here's another kind of a, uh, an overview of some of the cells that were traced by the players. Um, so the panel to the left is, um, is what we identified as integrator neurons. Uh, and I've just given them different colors based on some of their properties. Um, and then the panel to the right essentially is this, 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 this one cell in red is presynaptic to all these cells in orange. And the two views you're looking at are either from the top or from the side, essentially. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, so unlike the IY data set, since we actually have synapses, we can actually confidently tell who is presynaptic and who is postsynaptic. And we can then start building networks, essentially. So I believe that's the last of my slides. So. Thank you. <laughs> cool. All right, do you guys have any questions so far? Uh, actually, I would like to ask something, please. Sure. Um, uh, while playing the normal uh, version of the, of the eyewire from the, uh, from the mouse, mm -hmm. okay? I, I, as I have understood, this uh, conversation is about the zebrafish, right? Right, right. So let's go back, please, to the, to the, to the mouse. Um, I noticed that uh, the AI makes a big contribution at first uh, for um, um, finding uh, the first traces of the neurons. And then afterwards, player A or B, uh, etc., uh, contribute by adding um, some uh, parts of the um, neuron, right? Uh -huh. Okay, so... Um, is there any mechanism of uh, adding scientific uh, consensus? Uh, I mean, players playing the same and the same and confirming each other. In any, uh, iWire, you mean? Yeah. Yes, yes, in yeah. iWire, in the mouse, yes. Yeah, sure. So in iWire, we have multiple people map each cube. So for example, I'm, I've shared my, my iWire screen here. And if I click on any cube overview, 
Um, mm -hmm. You see in this little box right here, there's a list of players. Uh -huh. So for any, any given cube in a cell, we have multiple people play it. And it's typically anywhere from three to five players. Um, okay. And those, the weight of those players, so basically how much we trust the submission of those players is based on the history of the accuracy of those players as sure. compared to the accuracy of others. So we, we have a system that kind of combines set segments that were added by players that we trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that builds a final, well, an initial consensus of what you would see uh, straight in overview. And then, okay. and, then there's, okay. and then there's uh, the scouts and scythes who can interact with the overview and specifically look for anything that looks wrong or that looks like it's missing um, mm -hmm. from the cell. And then they can flag those cubes and, and actually adjust the consensus. And then the final check is that we have a team of game masters who do a final check over all the cells before they're determined to be complete. So we have a pretty good confidence right. actually in the in the consensus bywire, and it's and it's improved a lot over the years. I mean, when we first launched, it was anywhere from I think ten to twenty people did a single cube, and now it's mm -hmm. three to five. So we've been able to reduce the amount of duplication of effort. Hmm. So uh, it, it is very clear, and thank you very much for this, because uh, students were asking, uh, how do we know uh, that uh, this is correct? And I was talking about uh, consensus uh, based on um, uh, on ratings uh, uh, on empirical data. data. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing uh, I would like to uh, mention uh, about this uh, protein, the kinesin. Uh -huh. um, I, I am, Normally, students uh, think uh, like uh, it was uh, a human. It is walking. Uh, they say. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, it looks like a person walking. <laughs> yes. uh, but uh, I usually um, try to make things different uh, by saying that uh, these are different uh, shapes. I don't know how to say the exact word that the protein takes in space. So it finally it changes its position. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there is, a, there is a hydrophilic domain and a hydrophobic domain. Mm -hmm. uh, and each time it moves, the domains kind of swap. That's what pushes it forward. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much until now. <laughs> sure. And I saw a question, hold on, in iWire, I lost my mouse. <laughs> a question in iWire chat from Atani that was, well, are the vesicles bigger than the cross-section of the cytoskeleton? Um... I want to say yes. Uh, I think vesicles in general are larger than the cytoskeleton. Wow, cool. Well, did you guys have any other questions about iWire, Zebrafish, Neo? Hey, what about Neo? Is it coming? It's coming. <laughs> it is coming. <laughs> but like when though? I'm getting impatient. Yeah, I know. So are we. <laughs> yeah, so we, you know, it's, it's been more difficult than we had initially anticipated. Um, but right now we are teaching, you guys might have heard about this, but we're, we have this class going at University where there's a group of six graduate students who are basically functioning like a little indie game studio. And they're building a playable prototype of Neo. Um, it's actually going to be play tested next weekend in San Francisco at an NIH group meeting. Um, and we'll probably have it open for beta test. We definitely will have it open for beta testing by players um, before the end of the semester. And it's important to note that it's probably more of an alpha or pre alpha, uh, not really a, a final version. Um, but we will be launching a version of Neo that will be playable by um, probably by Scouts and Scythes and Mystics by the end of this year. And then it'll probably come out of beta and do like a full launch in 2019. But okay. we anticipate there being about 70,000 somas in the volume. Uh, and we anticipate that you know, roughly a single soma can have about one centimeter of axon. Wow. And, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's pretty That's crazy. huge. It's huge, yeah. And there's going to be rough, maybe a billion synapses or so in there. Uh, wow. so, oh, yeah, only a billion. That's yeah, still only a billion. So the task in Neo is going to be axon reconstruction. Oh, I do have one question about Neo, though. Sure. 
Um, are the EM images used for um, the cells in NEO the same as um, the process that Ashwin showed us? No, they're different. Are they that same resolution? They're going to be the same resolution, although they were, they were imaged on a TEM, not an SEM. So they're actually, they actually have better, better resolution. Oh, awesome. Okay. Mission electron microscopy versus uh, scanning electron microscopy. Right. So wow. so yeah so while while you're waiting for Neo you should all play zebrafish. Yeah, because zebrafish is going to be a good training section for Neo, basically because the AI in Neo is going to be much better than iWire. Um, you guys have seen um, some of the renders and images. Um, all the cells in those images were done fully automatically by the AI. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so impressive. yeah, it's, it's quite impressive. And, and that means that not only will we be able to go much faster, but it means that the parts that the AI is not able to get are going to be much more difficult. So it's really going to be like the top 5% of players are going to be the only ones good enough to, to help. Probably. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So, so zebrafish and mystic is a, is good training. Because the axons get get pretty thin, but I we're all at the lab really excited. I'm personally so stoked. I can't wait until we get the the full volume. We have this one one thousandth of what will be the final volume right now, and the cells are all cut off, and the, it's going to be amazing to see these gigantic neurons that have huge past dendrites, and then to be able to see all their synaptic connections, and then even some of the synapses that they form downstream from their axon, and it's it's certain that we will encounter all sorts of things that haven't been seen before. So it's going to be a really exciting scientific journey. I, I am excited to be a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so I don't know any other, hi, we've gone a little over time, but uh, are there any other questions while you guys are all here? Just okay. Um, have uh, the testing we have done in iWire been used to train the AI for Mystic and Neo. That's a great question. Um, well, it's it's I don't it's not the same um, data set. So the IY data set looks very different from the Zebrafish data set. So as far as I know, we had to re we had to basically make a whole new set of what we call ground truth. Mm -hmm. So that's actual manual annotation. Um, I, I don't think they're interchangeable, as far as I know. It was a, it was a new AI that was trained for Mystic, and then for Neo as well. It's a new AI that's being trained for it. Yeah, and so right now the the reconstructions in iWire are not feeding back in to improve the AI in iWire. We're just we're concentrating all of our effort on building these new future AIs because this Neo volume, this Neo data set is so huge. <laughs> uh, and it's very, there's some really tight timelines. So everybody's kind of working all full force ahead on that. Oh yeah, and then there was a, a question from Lynn here. Do we have one neuron synapsing multiple times on a single other neuron? For the, for the zebrafish volume. Um, then do you mean in zebrafish? I think, I think we do have some of that in iWire, don't we? I'm pretty sure there's a, there's a couple like starbursts that have multiple synapses on individual ganglion cells. And I know we've seen a little bit of that in the test volume from Neo, but I don't know about, do, do you see that in uh, zebrafish, Ashwin? Yes, in zebrafish we do. Cool. And then another question from Atani is, does Misty continue learning or is she done with what she knows how to trace? Oh, sorry, is she, is she, um, oh gosh, sorry. I'm going to that sentence. Okay, does Misty continue learning or is she done? And what does she know how to trace now um, and is, is that kind of the final of what she will know how to do? You know, what she knows is what she knows. Um, it'll improve only if you re retrain the AI, which we haven't done. 
Yeah, Misty can be incredibly erratic at times. Yeah, I mean, it was a one-time thing. Essentially, all the predictions that Misty made were were already kind of predicted when the when the AI ran. So the AI has run over the net over the entire data set once already. Uh, what Misty does is basically it only shows it for for that particular cell that's being traced. But it's already in theory it's been done for all the cells in the entire volume. Well, that's good because if it, if she did that all at once, it would be a giant mess. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so unless we retrain the AI, um, it, it may it may not get better. Hello, whoever whoever just joined. I can't see the people anymore. All right. Uh, let's see. We any other questions that you guys have before we sign off here? I'm good. Cool. Well, thank you everybody for joining and thank you so much Ashwin for putting these slides together and taking the time to introduce Zebrafish. We, I recorded this, uh, this broadcast, I guess, and we'll get it up on the iWire YouTube channel. So if you want to reference anything, um, and we'll also make a, a PDF of the slides that Ashwin shared so that you guys can mm -hmm. reference them at a later date if you want. Yeah, learned quite a bit. That was pretty enlightening. Thanks, Ashwin. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, yeah, thank you for thank devoting you. your time tracing this data set. It's super fun. I enjoyed it.